Uh, so we've looked at the figure of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, obviously, Christianity would not be the same without him. Uh, Paul the Apostle, again, if, <clears throat> as I said last time, the time before, if God had not raised up uh, Paul, uh, Christianity would have remained a, a splendor within the Jewish tradition. But Paul the Great Apostle to the Gentiles opened up the preaching of the gospel to the uncircumcised and did more than anyone else to promote that. And then last time we looked at the humble fisherman chosen by Jesus, called by him, uh, and that has left a, a lasting impact upon the Christian story, no doubt, with the Petrine uh, ministry of the church. Tonight we go into our fourth great figure. Uh, some have called Mary the mother of Jesus, also the first of his disciples. So we're going to look at the person of Mary. So what is a disciple in the broadest sense of the word? It is one who puts her faith or his faith in the person of Jesus. And so we could say in a way, did anyone put their faith in Jesus before Mary? Probably not. So that's why some uh, modern theologians like to call her the first of the disciples, the first follower of Jesus. Um, before we talk a bit more about Mary though, this evening, I just want to take a quick side note to mention a couple of things. Uh, we're not going to have an infinite number of evenings, so I can't talk about every individual that left a lasting impact on the Christian story. So I'm, I'm having to make a selection, obviously, of some sort. Um, I could have picked and did not some key figures that obviously have left forever their imprints upon the Christian story, uh, and I'll mention a few by name. Of the Gospel writer Mark, for example, he originated the idea of the Gospel could well have chosen him because since the time Mark wrote his gospel, Christianity has been in a gospel narrative form. You can also mention the other evangelists like Matthew, uh, who really did a wonderful synthesis of the Jewish tradition and the newness brought by Jesus. Or Luke with his unique way of proclaiming the gospel to the Gentiles and also telling the story of the church at its origins. And one also thinks of the beloved disciple, uh, the Gospel of John, and its uniqueness. All four of them, you could easily argue, have left uh, a permanent impact on Christianity. So maybe if I do a second year of key figures in the Christian tradition, <laughs> or two, we can, we can look at them. But those are not the people I'm going to talk about tonight. The other, the other thing I want to add is we talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus, tonight. Just this week I received a question from one of our journeyers, inquirers in the RCA process. And her question was, she asked very thoughtful questions. She said, I've been coming to St. Henry, you know, since, you know, late summer. I've heard a lot of different homilies given by the priests and deacons up into RCIA. And I'm getting the impression that the Catholic emphasis is more on men than women. And so most of the models that you talk about seem to be men. So, so, you know, I think she raises an important question, and, uh, and it's worthy of thinking about. And I did also invite her to come tonight, she couldn't, but um, because I said I'm going to be talking about one of the women who has impacted the Christian story really more than any other woman, uh, and that is Mary. Uh, and if you wonder, has Mary last a, left a lasting impact on Christianity? When you consider, for example, Western art alone, after the person of Jesus, there is no figure in Western art more represented than Mary. So she goes back to the ancient church. The earliest icons include always Mary holding the Christ child in her arms. So that's the most ancient form of Christian art Except when you go back to the symbolic art, for example, the catacombs, the symbol of the fish, the shepherd boy, and that sort of thing. But as Christian art takes off, and uh, in a permanently enduring way, Mary is preeminent among anyone but Jesus depicted in, in Christian art. In every form of art, in painting, in stained glass, in statuary, and icons, 
Um, it is hard to go to a Catholic church where you don't find at least one image of Mary, if not a multiple set of images of Mary, right? So, and the Eastern tradition, so, you know, the, the, the Christian tradition is both Western and Eastern, the Latin Rite and the Eastern Rite churches. Um, the Eastern churches have an immense regard for Mary, and the icons to Mary uh, are central parts of their, of their worship of, of God. So, uh, then think for a moment also about other sacred arts, like music. Uh, some of the most famous compositions that would come to your mind, for example, the Ave Maria, uh, or the Hail Mary put into Latin. So, and there are two great versions of the Ave Maria done by classical composers that have left, left a lasting impact on the, the musical traditions of the West. So, I even had, by the way, a wedding that I was part of. The wedding was between a Jew and a Catholic, and the rabbi did the wedding. It was a Jewish wedding with all the Jewish traditions, and they sang the Ave Maria as the mothers were being seated. So, you know, so well, it makes sort of sense because Mary was Jewish, of course, right, as was Jesus himself. So, so it works quite well. But I, I did find a little irony that uh, that was the uh, the piece chosen at that point. So, um, so the presence of Mary the one who bore Christ into the world, has had a lasting impact on Christianity. I also say, by the way, that had she not given birth to Jesus, there would be no Christianity. So, so uh, the, the feminine, the genius of woman, as Pope John Paul II called her, is at the very heart of Christianity. And uh, you also, by the way, we, we did come from, we have to be honest about it, uh, the Jewish tradition and, and the Western culture are what we call patriarchal traditions or cultures. So men are preeminent and predominant in all those cultures uh, and have been through most of the cultures of the Western world and throughout much of the globe, actually. Uh, so, so the exceptions help to prove the rule. And uh, in the first century, it was unusual in fact, almost unheard of for a rabbi to have a woman as a disciple. When Jesus goes around Galilee, both men and women become disciples. So he had this remarkable uh, approach to allow both men and women uh, as followers to be with him on the journey throughout Galilee. And Luke, probably among the four Gospels, will emphasize the women more than anyone else. So we'll mention that the women were with Jesus in Galilee. Uh, we hear that they accompanied Jesus to the crucifixion, to the resurrection. They saw the place where he was laid. And we shouldn't forget, <clears throat> it was women who went to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning first. And preeminent, by the way, among those disciples of Jesus who were women, uh, Mary of Magdala uh, is the one who announces to the apostles that Jesus is risen from the dead. So she is the apostle to the apostles. So that's one of her ancient uh, titles. So it's, you know, it's fascinating the role that women played and yet because of our patriarchal culture sometimes that role gets overlooked and unnoticed actually. So, but we even see traces of it in the New Testament. Think of the story of Martha and Mary. <clears throat> So uh, there's more going on that meets the eye in the narrative because Martha is doing the tasks of hospitality, which were expected of women in that culture, whereas Mary is, as a disciple would be, seated at the feet of the Master, receiving the word, and Jesus highly praises Mary for that role. She has assumed a role of real uh, discipleship in that moment. That's at least one important layer to that narrative of Martha and Mary. There are several woven in. But it's worth noting that Jesus did not, um, did not keep the expected social boundaries between women and men in his culture. So think for a moment also about the woman of Samaria, you know, who Jesus meets. And she's surprised that he's not respecting the boundaries. You know, you're talking to me and I'm a 
a Samaritan, you're a Jew, I'm a woman, you're a man. You know, you don't, we don't do these kind of things. Uh, so he doesn't let that sort of thing get in the way. So we could have chosen uh, other women, disciples of Jesus, but none is more preeminent than Mary. So we're going to focus on her tonight. Uh, interestingly, the earliest Christian writings, uh, and I've done a quick short outline of the board, the earliest Christian writer, of course, is St. Paul. So his writings start very early on. Uh, he never met the Jesus of history, as I said a couple of weeks ago. But he knew two important historical facts about Jesus. One, and this is almost all we get in terms of history from Paul, he was born of woman, and second, crucified. So his birth and death. So for Paul, it doesn't even give us the name of Mary. But for Paul, it is theologically significant that Jesus was born of woman. That's the foundation of our, of our knowing that Jesus, that we believe him, Son of God, God from, we say in the creed, God from God, light from my true God from true God, is truly and fully human in every way that we are except sin. And that's because of Mary and her contribution to the whole economy of salvation, if you want to put it that way. So in that sense, without Mary, we would have no Christianity. So that's how decisive her role is. So as you progress forward in time, most scholars regard the Gospel of Mark as the first of the four to have been written. It's almost certain that Matthew and Luke had a copy of the Gospel of Mark in front of them when they wrote their Gospels. So Mark is the most, in that sense, the originator of the Gospel genre. And uh, when you look at the figure of Mary, that becomes fairly clear, actually. So what is the portrait of Mary that you get in the Gospel of Mark? If you, just, if you only had one of the four Gospels and it was just Mark, what, what, what picture of Mary would you have? The answer is actually fairly limited. So I'll quote from the Gospel of Mark. So I'm in the third chapter um, and this is the only reference to uh, Mary that you'll find, and not by name, in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, he came home, that's Jesus came home. Again, the crowd gathered, making it impossible for them even to eat. When his relatives heard of this, they set out to seize him. For they said, he's out of his mind. So we have a reference to the family of Jesus gathering up because they think he's lost his mind. <coughs> the scribes who had come from Jerusalem said he's possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he drives out demons. So we have a little interpolation between um, uh, responding to those who think he's uh, possessed by demons. But then, in 30, verse 31, the family continues. So we hear about the family showing up. He's possessed. He's out of his mind. And then Mark tells us his mother and his brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent word to him and called to him. A crowd seated around him told him, Your mother and your brothers and your sisters in some ancient texts are asking about you. But he said to them in reply, Who are my mother? and my brothers. And looking around at those seated in the circle, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. That's the only reference in the Gospel of Mark that we have to the mother of Jesus. So what would be your conclusion if you only had Mark to go on? All right. She's kind of outside the circle, right? She's outside the house asking about him, and he focused on this inner circle inside the room. You are my mother, my brothers and sisters. Well, Marcus, in that part of his gospel, by the way, he's making a big distinction between insiders and outsiders. Those on the inside get it, those on the outside don't. So it's not in Mark's gospel the most positive portrait However, you, we never end with the Gospel of Mark. That's where you kind of start in the primitive tradition. So where do we go beyond that? So the next Gospel witness 
is the gospel I'm going to look at of Matthew. Now, it's curious. Uh, what can we find out from Matthew that we don't know from Mark? There's really only one place that we go in Matthew's gospel where we get something new about the family of Jesus, and it's the first two chapters. You all probably know him well from the Christmas story. Now, I want to just highlight real quickly, Matthew and Luke have very distinct Christmas stories. So in the Gospel of Matthew, for example, there are no shepherds that show up. Uh, but you do have Magi who arrive from the East, which you don't find in the Gospel of Luke. It's also interesting, we'll come to Luke in a moment, but in Matthew, who is the principal character in the infancy stories? Who is the main figure, as it were? All right, actually, if you read it as literature, it's not the baby, although we would say, of course, Jesus is always at the center. Yeah, it's always the figure of Christ for us Christians, of course. But listen to the beginning of this gospel after the genealogy. By the way, the genealogy um, traces uh, the descendants of Jesus through Joseph. So it says at the end, Jacob, the father of Joseph, Listen to the description, the husband of Mary. So Matthew gives us her name. Of her was born Jesus, who was called the Messiah. So Jesus is clearly the focal point. Now this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about when his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. That's how the story begins in Matthew. So Joseph is the principal character in the, in the narrative. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. So what is Matthew giving us? He's giving us a viewpoint on the birth of Jesus that is from the eyes of Joseph. It's the angel who comes to him in the dream and says, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And uh, that's exactly what he does. And then the Magi show up, they offer their gifts of gold, ring, incense, and myrrh. There's no animal, animals, no major. Uh, they're in the house. Uh, and then the angel appears to Joseph again and gives him a warning. What's the warning? Uh, Herod's going to try to kill the children, get her out of town, get that child to safety. So in Matthew's version, the principal character is Joseph. Mary is his wife. Although it's interesting, he calls her the husband. He calls Joseph the, the husband of Mary, which is an unusual ancient usage. So Mary, even in Matthew's community, has a special place. So the three of them become what we would call today refugees. They have to flee from their own country and emigrate to Egypt under threat of danger. Uh, you know, the Christians tradition, by the way, loved that element of Matthew's story. And uh, there are sites along the way going to Egypt that mark various places that the Holy Family stopped. And places within Egypt, by the way, also that commemorate that moment. And when you get to the second century, there are additional Gospels that give you more information about the journey to Egypt. For example, one of the second century Gospels uh, tells the, the story about Mary being hungry and Joseph was tired and unwilling to climb the tree to get something for fruit for Mary to eat. And the Christ child looked derisively at him and made the tree bend over to offer the fruit to his mother. So, <laughs> so, you know, you know, so that element of the story gets carried on. Uh, and then a third angelic visitation, and this time the angel will announce that it's safe to go back uh, about the king that stalked the child's life is dead, and that's when Matthew tells us they settled in Nazareth. So you do get um, some information about the, the birth of Jesus from the perspective of Matthew, but you're definitely aware of Mary's presence in the narrative, and she is spoken of by name, unlike in the Gospel of Mark or in Paul's writings. So I mention this because you can see that Matthew Maybe 10 years beyond Mark has gotten a bit more about Mary and his gospel. Uh, I also want to turn for a moment to the Gospel of John, probably the last of the four to be written as a very long tradition that builds up to the writing of the gospel.
the mother of Jesus appears in that gospel at two very decisive moments. Uh, but she's never named, so you don't hear the name of Mary in the Gospel of John. Anyone know the first appearance of the mother of Jesus in John's Gospel? Or at least the wedding feast at Cana. And there, this is a very significant moment. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is present at the wedding feast of Cana. The wine has run out. And Mary is the one who says to her son, uh, we need to do something about this. And the response of Jesus, by the way, in Greek is not very positive. It's sort of, what does this have to do with me? Woman, you wouldn't call your mother woman in public. Woman, what does this have to do with me? Uh, so it's this an interesting moment in the Gospel of John, but in fact, he does what she says, and he takes care of the problem. So John will tell us this is the first of the signs that Jesus performed. So it's the opening up of the beginning of his ministry of signs, of wonders in the Gospel of John. Uh, now, if you study John's Gospel carefully, what John is going to tell us all through his Gospel is that Jesus came to fulfill all that the Father prepared his people for throughout the old, what we call the Old Testament. And, but Jesus not only came to fulfill it, but he transcends it. He's better than any of the things that came before him. So what do you have at the wedding of Cana? You have purification jugs that held water. The Jewish uh, people used them to purify themselves. What's John telling us? Okay, that was good. Here you have water to purify yourself, but now we have something better. We have, now we have wine. And not only do we have wine, we have the best of wine. So the best has been saved till the very end. So who is the best wine? Jesus himself. So it's really what we call a Christological point, but we shouldn't forget that his mother makes that moment possible. Uh, now, what's the second moment in the Gospel of John where Mary appears? Or at the crucifixion. So John will tell us very importantly that at the cross of Jesus, Mary was standing. He's the only one of the four, I think, who, spe who specifies that the mother of Jesus is there. I think that's an important passage, so I'm going to look at it briefly. And so in the Gospel of John, this is what the soldiers did. And then John says, after they divided the garments, he notes in, and we're in chapter 19, verse 25, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister. Mary, the wife of Clopas, and we don't know if the wife of Clopas is his mother's sister or that's a third person. So there could be three or four women there. And Mary of Magdala. So three or four women are standing there. So you have Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, his mother's sister, who would be Jesus' aunt, of course. Mary, the wife of Clopas. That could be a third person if that's not the same as the mother's sister. And Mary of Magdala. It's interesting. That's why we get so confused, because we have three Marys at the foot of the cross. <laughs> There's so many Marys you get them confused sometimes. <coughs> when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, so a re reference now to the three or four women, and also the beloved disciple. In Mark's gospel, what does Mark say? All the men left at the moment of his death. It was the women who stood by and saw where how he died and where he was buried. Uh, but Luke, uh, John tells us that the beloved disciple was there. And uh, then he says to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. So this figure of Mary at the foot of the cross is the beginning of a new relationship with the Christian community. So the, the beloved disciple, in a sense, represents all disciples of Jesus. And his mother, then, is given to all of us as our mother. 
and we are given to such a mother as sons. So in that sense, Jesus is making all of us his brothers and sisters. So she too is our mother, and we are also her daughters and sons. It's really quite profound that the moment that is dying on the cross for us, that's the last uh, gift he gives before he offers himself completely for us. So uh, those two pivotal moments in the Gospel of John, wedding feast of Cana, the first of his signs, and then that moment when he is exalted on the cross and entrusts us to the care of Mary. By the way, it was Pope Paul VI, now St. Paul VI, who at the Second Vatican Council formally taught Mary is the mother of the church, and it comes right out of this Joannine theology. So if Mary's the mother of all of us, we're the church, she's therefore the mother of the church. It's kind of a beautiful uh, reflection back to John's Gospel. Or to mention all of those things, uh, because they are very important moments. I will also add that Luke has written for us uh, the second book, the Acts of the Apostles, and in the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, in chapter 1, verse 14, what does Luke tell us? He tells us that the 11 disciples after the resurrection, waiting for the coming of the Spirit of Pentecost, were gathered in the upper room, and who does Luke tell us was with them in the upper room? Mary. Very important significance. We're going to circle back around to Luke in a minute, but he wrote part two, the Acts of the Apostles, where there's an explicit reference to the presence of Mary in the Apostolic Church. So what John tells us about that connection between Mary and us is evidenced in the Acts of the Apostles. That probably also means that Mary was there on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit descended uh, and was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in Western art and in Eastern art, you will also find depictions of Pentecost with Mary uh, seated among the twelve, or the eleven, all receiving the Holy Spirit. When you go to the, uh, and so this is an appropriate time to mention this, when you go to Jerusalem, there's a church called the Church of the Dormition, which is where the Eastern churches uh, remember that moment when Mary fell asleep at the end of her life on earth, thus the Church of Dormition. And when you go to the lower level, there's an image of Mary lying on her back asleep, and she is surrounded by candles, as I recall. And above her, in mosaic form, uh, are all the women of the Old Testament who prepared for her. So the great women of the Old Testament are above Mary as she lies in sleep. And when you go to the end of that chapel, there is a depiction of Pentecost Sunday, and there is Mary right in the center with the eleven gathered around her with a spirit in the form of tongues of fire coming down upon her. So, so you have a beautiful moment depicted. And we also have in the, in the Latin rite a tradition that the beloved disciple took Mary to his home in Ephesus. So she stayed there for a while. And if you try to harmonize the Eastern and Western traditions, she must have gone back to Jerusalem when she <clears throat> fell into her final sleep. And we as Catholics, I'll mention now, and I'll say a bit more about it later, but uh, we have uh, formally defined as a matter of dogma that at the end of her life on earth, Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven to be forever with her son. Now, we don't say in that definition, that was in 1950, uh, we don't say whether she died before she was assumed into heaven or not. So one the theological point of speculation is when we said at the end of her life on earth, she was assumed into heaven, body and soul. Did she, did she, was she assumed before she died, so she didn't have to die, or she fell asleep in death, and then was assumed into heaven. So that's one question that our dogma of the assumption doesn't really address or answer specifically, so it's left open at this point. All right, and then I'll also add, by the way, before we look at Luke, uh, who's the greatest New Testament witness to Mary, by the way, uh, that uh, St. Ignatius uh, of Loyola, when he writes his spiritual exercises, the whole purpose of the exercises is to enable someone to, to grow closer to the person of Jesus and be transformed so that we would become free to follow him, to love him, and to serve him. And so what he will do is, after leading you through an awareness of God's love and, and your 
own need for God's grace, your own sin, he will lead you to the call of Christ and through the life of Christ. And the ultimate purpose is to get to his death and resurrection so that you'll live the rest of your life uh, loving and serving and praising God as a disciple of Jesus. But one of the things that Ignatius has you pray with on Easter Sunday morning when you're praying with the Easter mystery is what Ignatius will call the first appearance of the risen Lord, not recorded in scripture, by the way, to his mother Mary. So I remember when I first did my Ignatian retreat, of course, it's not, there's no appearance of the risen Jesus in the New Testament, right? So to Mary, when Ignatius instructed us to pray that way, to imagine that, that we're there when the risen Lord appears to his mother, uh, I was telling Father Joe, I, I came back from my retreat and I said, you know, I was asked to do this on my retreat and I said, you know, it's not in scripture. And so uh, Father Joe said, well, what happened? And I said, well, of course he did. In my prayer, he did appear to Mary, so, you know. So, uh, but someone said later to me, they said, well, wouldn't that be fitting? I mean, who else would Jesus go to first? You know, other than his mother. And it doesn't have to be recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John to know that his mother must have experienced him risen first before anyone else. So I'll leave that for your theological imaginations um, in terms of Easter Sunday morning. Um, but in my prayer, I have, I've prayed with that scene more than once on retreats, and it's been extremely profound. Uh, so I think that the risen Lord did appear to his mother. So Paul will tell us he appeared to many disciples, and she's with the apostolic church, and he certainly did, but again, I'll leave that to your imagination. So I want to, with the New Testament, I want to really, though, shine the spotlight for a bit on the Gospel of Luke. And why? Because Luke, among the entire New Testament witness, gives us a portrait of Mary that has really prepared the Christian tradition for the 2,000 years plus that will follow. So ever since the Gospel of Luke was written, our picture of Mary really preeminently is shaped by Luke and that Gospel, more than Mark, Matthew, and John, almost put together, or Paul certainly. So, and the passage I'm about to read, and, and it's intimately connected in Luke's Gospel with uh, the birth of Jesus, you all know it by heart, you've heard it so many times. Every Christmas you hear it. But we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be complacent to the fact and, and not let ourselves be once more astonished by what takes place. So I want to read this uh, first encounter to you. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, favored one, or full of grace, we've said traditionally. The Lord is with you. Notice the greeting to Mary. Hail, full of grace, highly favored. This is before Jesus is conceived. Mary already has a unique, so much so, by the way, that we Catholics in the 1800s also formally defined by dogma that Mary, from the very first moment of her conception, was protected and kept free from original sin and never sinned in her life. So she is singularly prepared by God to be the mother of the Son, full of grace, highly favored, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Isn't that a very human response on the part of Mary? When you go to Nazareth, where the Annunciation took place, you find between the Church of the Annunciation itself and the church that is built over what was believed to be the site of uh, Joseph's workshop, you find this image of Mary in bronze, life size, as big as we are. And she's in the courtyard walking along, and the angel is right behind her shoulder, leaning over, speaking to her. And Mary's got her hands like this, and she's looking back at the angel like, who, me? <laughs> you know, the captures in beautiful bronze art, that moment of deeply trouble. What sort of greeting is this? What's this all about? 
You have found favor with God. Oh wait, she was greatly troubled. So was like, then the angel said to her, "Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus." It was the father's role of the way the ancient world to name children. You will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. So Mary is to take from this. He's going to be a king. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. That's a powerful announcement, isn't it, on the part of this angel visiting to Mary. But Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I have no relations with a man? Uh, literally, I don't, I've never known a man. Well, so when you hear in Genesis, Adam knew Eve, Gada in Hebrew, and they begot a child. So when you know someone intimately, birth happens. So this is an intimate knowing. So Mary says, I've never known a man. And the angel said to her, reply, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who is called Mary. For nothing will be impossible with God. St. Bernard has a reflection on this moment of the Annunciation. We find it in the Liturgy of the Hours. And Bernard says this, he says, Mary, this is not the moment to hesitate. This is not the moment for silence. Silence is good, but sometimes you have to be ready to say yes. He goes, Mary, all of creation is waiting for your yes. Adam and Eve are waiting in shale for your, everybody is waiting for your yes. Don't hesitate now. Your, your humility, your timidity, your prudence is good, but this is not the time. We need courage now. Speak up and say yes, basically. I'm paraphrasing Bernard a little bit, but that's the gist of the whole thing. It's like, Mary, you have to say yes for all humanity, for all creation. It has to be redeemed. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. So powerful. What does Mary say in essence? She says, yes, let it be. And because of that willingness that undoubtedly was girded in immense courage, immense trust in God, immense faith, <coughs> Mary's willingness to step out on the limb and say yes to the invitation. Then the angel departed from her. Someone once said that's the most important line because you know, when the angel's there, everything is easy, but once the angel's gone, you've got to do it all on your own. Not really. God <laughs> is always with you, but in essence, that yes is just the beginning of the whole process, right? It's the beginning. We all know, of course, that this yes, it's like the yes of marriage. When you say yes to being married, you don't know all the things that are going to happen along the way when you're saying yes to this person across from you, right? You, if you knew everything that you were going to go through, you might not say yes quite so quickly sometimes. <laughs> Good times and in bad, sickness and in health till death do us part. I'm always thinking, you know, when I look at couples make those promises, you know, they're kind of like smiling at us in a romantic, you know, <coughs> well, that yes is going to require a lot of work on your part. And also the yes of Mary, you know, the suffering that she will endure. Uh, that's why we have a feast in the Catholic tradition called Our Lady of Sorrows. Because we, we're, and you know, the church of St. Mary downtown is really the church of St. Mary of the Seven Sorrows, because the pain that our son will endure, and any of you all who are mothers know that, don't you? When your child is suffering, you suffer with that. So the, the unbearable pain that she undoubtedly experienced as her son accepted his own cross. By the way, I think that's one of the beautiful moments in uh, the film, The Passion of the Christ, if you've seen it. When Jesus is walking along the way uh, and falls, he looks down the alley and there is his mother Mary, and he says to her, Behold, I make all things new. So it's the work that he is doing to save humanity, 
to redeem creation. And he, you know, in, in Mel Gibson's artistic art form of that film, it's announced so beautifully at that moment uh, to Mary, his mother. All right, so um, I think there was much to be said about this moment in time. Uh, most biblical scholars believe that Mary was around 14 years old. So a girl, we would say in the eighth grade today, who grew up in the village of Nazareth. She would have been a daughter of Israel. She would have been schooled in the faith of her ancestors. She must have been remarkably open to the grace of God in her life and to such an invitation, so well prepared. Uh, and in that humble act of great trust and courage and her great yes, we could say all of humanity is transformed. So much so that in that yes, in that very moment, uh, Christ becomes now present in this creation. Uh, he becomes conceived in her womb. So when you go to Nazareth and the lowest level of the Church of the Annunciation uh, or excavated down to the first century level, there is a, a, the most ancient chapel of the, of the different levels has an altar and on it in Latin are the words, and here the word of God became flesh. So, so that's the moment of what we call incarnation. And for the next nine months, of course, uh, he will be carried in hiddenness in the womb of his mother Mary. She will be, as it were, the tabernacle of the word made flesh until his birth. Um, so Luke, I mean, he, it's a masterpiece. And this particular moment in the gospel scenes has been depicted beautifully in Western art very often in many different formats. It's a very theologically significant moment. Uh, it's the narrative form of John's gospel saying the word was God and the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. All right, but the next scene also very important so Luke unfolds things in a very powerful and dramatic way. Uh, during those days, Mary set out and traveled to the hill country in haste to a town of Judah. It's amazing. Here, this 14-year-old girl has just found out she is conceiving a child through the Holy Spirit, and her first act is to begin a great journey. So when God calls people in the scriptures uh, like Abraham and Sarah uh, and Jacob and, and uh, Rebecca, often it involves great journeys. It's the beginning. God is going to do something immense. A great journey ensues. So Mary begins a great journey. She enters the house of Zechariah, who was of the priestly division. We know that from earlier in Luke. And greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in her womb and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb leaped for joy. And these are the words of Elizabeth. So you are blessed among women, and also the fruit of your womb. Blessed are you who believed that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. Um, in the early church, one of the most important descriptions of Mary was Mary is the new Eve. So the first Eve, the mother of all, the living Genesis tells us, gives birth to humanity, but Eve had turned from God by her disobedience. And now Mary becomes the new Eve who by her obedience opens the way for the Savior of the world. So uh, these moments of uh, turning points even in history are marked by this great turning point of the new Eve and her trusting that the Lord's word spoken to her would be fulfilled. Recognized by the woman, if you go to uh, this church of the visitation in Jerusalem, outside Jerusalem. There's also a beautiful bronze image of Mary and Elizabeth standing side by side, and they're both expecting a child, a 
Of course, Elizabeth is more pregnant than Mary. So the two women side by side, standing and looking out over the corridor <laughs> together. And there behind uh, the, that statue, you have what is called the Magnifica, which I'm going to read next. Uh, and many of the languages of the world, including Latin, English, Aramaic, the mother tongue of Jesus. Um, I think it might also be the Lord's Prayer is certainly the other church in Cherokee, for example. So all the nations of the world uh, with different languages, uh, the Magnificat. I will also add, by the way, um, for us Catholics, uh, Mary, as a member of the communion of saints, is the preeminent member of the communion of saints. I think it's fair to say that most Catholics have a connection with Mary that is second only to their connection with God himself, Father, Son, and Spirit. She's the most intimate. And I had this professor in college who said, you know, when you meet a good friend, you want to meet, you want to meet his or her mother too because you want to know who the person really is and you learn it when you meet their mother, which is so true, isn't it? So but the impact of a mother uh, on her children is very significant. So important, by the way, is the Magnificat of Mary, her proclamation at this moment, that it's become the regular evening prayer of the church. So 365 days a year, every single evening, the church as part of its evening prayer, sings or recites Mary's Magnificat. So it's the daily prayer of the church. I will also add a moment about devotions, that second only probably to the Our Father, for Catholics, it's the words of the angel addressed to Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Uh, that's become our most popular prayer. So after they learn the Lord's prayer that he taught us, uh, learn the Hail Mary second, and then the glory be is right there with it. So, so here are the words of Mary uh, in response to what Elizabeth says. And Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked upon his handmaid's lowliness. Behold, from now on, all ages will call me blessed. The Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is from age to age on those who fear him. So how does Mary's prayer begin, her praise? Her soul magnifies the Lord. Her spirit rejoices in God her Savior. So all of Mary's attention is focused on God. And yet, look what God has done for me, his loveliest handmaid. He has lifted me up. But then Mary knows this is not just a moment about her and God. This moment of yes is for everyone. So listen to how the prayer unfolds. His mercy is from age to age on those who fear him. He has shown might with his arm, dispersed the arrogant of mind and heart. The way we say it in most our evening prayer translation, he has scattered the proud in their conceit. So the coming of the Son of Man by Mary's humble yes means that pride and conceit get scattered. He has thrown down the rulers from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. So there's something about the incarnation, Mary's participation, that means from now on, those who have power and importance in the world are set aside and the little lowly ones are going to be lifted up and raised to a place of preeminence. By the way, when you read the rest of the whole Gospel of Luke, that's exactly what Jesus says on his lips. He repeats his mother's language. He learns it well. The hungry he has filled with good things. So imagine that the hungry now are going to feast because of what's happened here. The rich he has sent away empty. So this great turning of upside down in the world. He has helped Israel, his servant, remembering his mercy, according to his promise to our fathers and to Abraham and to his descendants 
forever. So this is a, a moment of what we would call cosmic importance that has taken place here. Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. So um, this, by the way, will be matched by what we call the Benedictus, the words of, of uh, Zechariah, uh, which the church uses every morning for its morning prayer. So Luke has this, what you call this great parallelism in his gospel. He always puts a pair of people together, and often it's man and woman. So Mary and uh, Zechariah in the temple will see Simeon and Anna, both waiting for the Christ child. So Luke is very, in that sense, inclusive of women, more than any of the other Gospels, by the way. So if you're looking for a place that highlights the importance of the role of women in the economy of salvation, Luke's Gospel is a, an important entryway. What else will Luke tell us about Mary, the mother of Jesus? Uh, he will tell us the birth story uh, from the most familiar narrative that we're part of, which is Mary and Joseph traveling uh, to Bethlehem, uh, finding no room in the end. So Matthew has them being refugees, expelled from their home country, uh, having to search for lodging in Egypt. Luke will tell us there's no, there's no room at the place where the travelers stay normally in Bethlehem. So in a sense, that experience of not quite fitting in, homelessness, being born, uh, and the animals were kept apart from the main dwelling place, and probably it was also an act of mercy, you know, let's not have her give birth out here in public with all the other people, let's give her a little quiet out there with the animals to have the birth of the child. So, you know, there was, there was an act of hospitality on someone's part in Bethlehem, watching out for Mary right at the outset and on the birth of Jesus. And of course, who shows up to witness this great event? And it goes right along with Mary's Magnificat. It's what, what they would call in the first century, your humble, hardworking people, it's the shepherds. It was a job that a lot of people didn't like to do, hardworking, a messy shepherds show up in the, in the dark to adore the Christ child. And it says, Mary tells us, Luke tells us that Mary treasured, kept all these things in her heart. Uh, but Luke will also tell us in the temple when Jesus is presented uh, and a sword of sorrow will pierce your heart too. So the many are going to be a rising and fall of uh, people as a result of this child of yours and you're going to suffer too. So Luke gives us that prophetic prediction about Mary's own suffering. So I think Luke is the one who better than anyone else really gives us an insight into the person of Mary. Before I move beyond uh, the scriptural witnesses to the person of Mary, uh, to her impact on the tradition of Christianity, any questions or observations? So that, that tradition, um, and I don't know a lot about that, those specifics, but that was um, the practice in first century Judaism that men and women were kept in separate places. That's why um, one of the things about Martha and Mary, if Martha is going out and doing the business of taking care of Jesus, Martha was probably trying to watch out for Jesus too because she doesn't want to leave Mary and Jesus alone together. So you wouldn't want to leave a man and a woman in the room together. That's one of the reasons that the Samaritan would have well is scandalized because the disciples have left and just the two of them left behind. So that would be a violation of protocol. So that tradition would keep that intact, the safety of they're not under the same roof kind of thing, especially if there were not other people around. I'll also add very quickly to, as a quick scriptural aside, which I didn't go into, but Luke is not hesitant to also tell us a story of Jesus at 12 
when he is lost in the temple and he indicates that God is the true father. But Mary, you know, Mary says, your father, referring to Joseph, and I were very worried about you. Why have you done this to us? You know, so it, it shows us a, a human moment in the mother, too, who had to go through the same stuff we all have to go through. Uh, I also think it's helpful, by the way, when you do your spiritual exercises with Ignatius, he invites you to spend a day uh, praying with what's called the hidden life of Jesus. So imagine, so Jesus went in his public ministry around 30 years of age. Joseph died somewhere probably between 12 and 30, probably in his late teens. So Jesus was the carpenter, he did the work. Uh, imagine all the moments of life that mother and son shared uh, through the years and how much the person of Mary shaped and formed Jesus in his humanity. That's all hidden from us. It's all part of what we call the hidden life of Jesus. So when you're praying, it's kind of it's kind of good sometimes to take time in that prayer to imagine what was that relationship of mother and son like? Are you going to speak about experiences? Yes, I sure am. Post scriptural. All right, so I do want to. Uh, I ended with, uh, Mary has become a permanent icon of the history of the church. Uh, so the, the, the person of Mary is what we might say indelibly imprinted upon Christianity. It's hard to imagine Christianity without the role of Mary. Now we'll say in the 1500s, the Protestant reformers often reacted against the role of Mary uh, sometimes they felt that Mary was put in the place of God and worshipped at the same level as God, or the, the popular devotions felt that people could go to Mary and therefore were sometimes uh, fearful of God and so forth. Um, and there is some truth to that. I mean, sometimes people have a fear of God's greatness, and uh, Mary seems more approachable because she's fully human like us. And someone once made the remark, you know, when your mother asks you to do something, you can't say no very easily. So if you want help with uh, asking someone to pray for you, turn to Mary because, you know, a mother always gets her son to do it, but, you know, they want. So there's a special role for Mary's intercession on our behalf. But that said, uh, authentic Christian spirituality never distances, Mary would never distance us from God or lead us to fearfulness about God but should draw us always closer to her son. So in that sense, it's not that we should somehow make God immensely more fearful, therefore Mary is much more approachable, but in the very maternal care of Mary on our behalf, should we discover something of God's great tenderness and care for us. So she is an icon of God, as it were, and the heart of God. So we see reflected in the immaculate heart of Mary, actually, the love of the sacred heart of her son. So those two hearts and a correct Christian spirituality are close together, not apart from each other. So uh, one of the most important titles for Mary in the Christian tradition, she is called in Greek Theotokos, God-bearer. We use the words most often in English translated, she is mother of God. And the question was so important, some denied it, because they said she was the mother of the humanity of Jesus. But the response was, but once Jesus is incarnate in Mary, God and man are together, they're one. So she is mother of Jesus Christ, who is both human and divine. Therefore, it's correct to say Mary is mother of God. And we have added that to our Hail Mary, in fact. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Holy Spirit. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So I mentioned already sacred art and music. I would also add that Mary has probably played what I would call the central role in the devotional life of Catholics. So, uh, so when you think about probably the most common Catholic devotion, apart from the sacraments like Mass, what's the number one Catholic devotion? <laughs> the rosary, head and shoulders above everything else. And uh, the rosary is a beautiful prayer form because it enables us who are Christian believers to stand with Mary in contemplating the mystery of her son. So when you go through the whole full sets of mysteries, and we have four of them these days since Pope John Paul II, 
You have the, the moments surrounding the birth of Jesus, so beautifully depicted by Luke in the Joyful Mysteries. You've got the ones that John Paul the Great added, the luminous ones about his life. You have the moments surrounding his death on the cross, the sorrowful, and the moments around the resurrection pointing us to eternity. So as Pope John Paul II rightly said in his letter about the rosary, in, in essence, when you pray the rosary, you're praying the gospel. You have the whole mystery of salvation unfolded before your very eyes from the vantage point of Mary's eyes gazing upon her son. Um, there are many wonderful things to say, by the way, about the rosary. The entire month of October that we're in right now is devoted to the rosary. And I would dare say that many Catholics uh, would use the rosary as their daily prayer, more so than perhaps any other prayer form. Uh, back in the medieval period, when the monks were uh, reciting the 150 psalms, even before the modern rosary was developed, they would use uh, beads and they would pray 150 Our Fathers along those beads. So why did they do that? Because they couldn't read or write, they couldn't read the psalms, but they in their own way wanted to participate in the Liturgy of the Hours, and they did it with the Lord's Prayer 150 times. So. You follow the rosary around you with, I think, 150 beads. So the structure of the prayer is um, also uh, very healing because it involves the whole body. Many people walk, or I do it when I'm driving too, when they're doing the rosary, so you're in movement, your hands are moving along the beads. The very repetitive nature of the prayer is sort of like a mantra in that recitation frees the mind up to focus on the mystery that's being caught. So the, the prayer form has so much with it that it enables it to be uh, connecting us to the mystery of God, but we do it through Mary. So the other thing I would add is that in addition to the month of October, uh, we celebrate Mary in the month of May, and many of you as Catholics will also remember that devotional month of May when we celebrate Mary's crowning as Queen of Heaven and Earth. Um, and I will also add, and certainly not least, um, and by the way, the rosary has really become what it is today and its popularity in the last 500 years. So it's almost like when the Protestant Reformation took place and the Protestants were reacting against uh, except, uh, what they considered excessive devotions, Catholics deepened their devotional life and really clung to that prayer form and a demon. But the other thing that's happened in the past 500 years is that there have been numerous uh, appearances of Mary throughout the world and sacred pilgrimage places. When you go back to ancient Christianity, the number one pilgrimage place was always to go follow in the footsteps of Jesus, to go to the Holy Land. That was the beginning of pilgrimage. But even when you go there, who's one of the most prominent people you run into everywhere? Mary. So there are churches to her everywhere. You've got the, you've got the, the church of the Orthodox built over the spring of Mary in Nazareth where the angel first appeared. You've got the church of the Annunciation over which successive churches have been built. You have the church of the Visitation. You have the church of the Nativity. It's all the moments that we celebrate and the mysteries of the Rosary, by the way, you can almost associate every one of them with some place you go in the Holy Land. So that's how prominent Mary was, even in the ancient pilgrimages. Um, second great sign of pilgrimage was the city of Rome, tombs of the Peter and Paul the Apostle. Third great pilgrimage site in the ancient world, in the medieval period especially, the tomb of St. James the Apostle, Santiago de Compostela. So, but in the modern world, since 1500, more and more, the great pilgrimage centers have actually been these places where Mary has appeared. And I would mention three preeminent ones, and I'll just mention a few others in passing, but probably the three worldwide that are most well-known uh, are Fatima and Lourdes, so in Portugal and France, uh, and also for us in the Americas, and certainly worldwide in the Spanish-speaking world, uh, but Our Lady of Guadalupe. And the interesting thing about the appearances of Mary in the modern 
world is that Mary almost always appears to people who are either children, the simple and humble, the poor, the uneducated, people who are suffering or struggling in some way. Those are the people that Mary appears to. Uh, it's interesting, she doesn't show up often at, uh, at luxury banquets or the place of wealth and honor. She doesn't show up in the churches and the rectories and the, uh, at the Vatican, places like that. Um, it's funny, you know, when you go to Ireland to knock, uh, where Mary showed up, it's one of the few of apparitions of Mary where she doesn't say anything, she just says something about her appearance. But the, the priest was out visiting the sick, and it was a rainy day when she first appeared. And uh, they tried to tell him she's out of the lawn, and he said, I'm too busy to come outside and see all this. So, you know, so, you know it's, it's funny who notices and who doesn't. So with Lourdes in particular, uh, the need for healing, and Lourdes is a great center of healing, and thought about, again, the children, uh, in preparation for, and, and what is the message of Mary focused on very often? Core fundamental themes of the gospel. Repent and believe the good news. Pray fast. God loves you. You know, it's the, the core of what Jesus proclaimed is on the lips of Mary wherever she appears. So that's, you know, in that sense, the church, by the way, is very, almost always very hesitant to accept so-called supernatural appearances, what we call private revelations. Uh, they want to make sure that such appearances are authentic. So they usually wait until the appearances cease happening. They study the whole thing, and they, they look for certain things. Are the encounters with the purported apparition, are they consonant with our faith? Do they cohere with what we believe about God revealed by Jesus? So do they correspond to the gospel truth? The second thing you look for is do they produce what we would call the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Do they lead to lives that are changed, where faith, hope, and love are lived out, and the church sees such evidence? It will sometimes formally approve and say, we believe this is an authentic apparition of Mary, the Mother of God. And one can look no further than Lord's and Father, but to see great positive healing fruit and Guadalupe uh, that has come through the centuries uh, to people who are through the decades as people go to these places. So um, sometimes people ask me about um, uh, Mejigoria. It's probably one of the more famous places that has reported apparitions of Mary. I believe that those apparitions are still unfolding, so the church will not probably make a final definitive judgment until that's all finished. Uh, but I will say that I know many people who have traveled there and have had profound spiritual experiences that are consonant with our faith. So they've had a deepening of faith, hope, and love. So you always look for the fruits that flow out of it. And you know, any one of us uh, can have an experience of closeness with Christ or his mother or the saints. So I know someone who was gravely ill, uh, uh, who was anointed in the hospital, and uh, when she was anointed, saw Mary standing at the foot of her bed. And Mary gave her a choice, do you want to stay here or do you want to come with me now? And she said, I still have to raise my kids. And she said, no, I still want to stay. And then she said, a very great peace came to her in that moment, of Mary's presence with her at that moment. So, uh, so it's no wonder that Mary is also called uh, the consolation of Christians. So if I went through all the titles of Mary, we would spend another hour here tonight. Uh, you know, she has received uh, many uh, beautiful descriptions. Uh, she's depicted in art. Uh, one of the more recent ones that's kind of become more conscious in the modern church is Mary as the untire of knots. And that beautiful image of Mary untying the knots that bind up and especially concerned for married couples who are troubled, so I'm tying their knots. How do you think there's the co-redemptive title? All right, the co-redemptrix, yeah. I will add with uh, titles like Mediatrix and co-redemptrix, the one has
has to approach those titles with great theological care because Jesus is the unique and sole mediator of God's grace and the sole uh, redeemer. So insofar as we use something like that of Mary, we should never prejudice the unique role that Jesus himself plays at that center. Now, I've gone over my 8 o'clock hour, so if you have questions, grab me afterwards. Is that okay? And uh, our next class is going to be on the 12th of November, and you will meet the next great figure in Christian tradition who will change the shape of Christianity. Uh, so we should close with a Hail Mary. Hail Mary, all of the grace, the Lord is with me. Let's go.